fact that many homeowners, given the opportunity, would love to have a home like this. It actually resembles a mansion built in Europe hundreds of years ago, out of stone. And as you know, most of those homes are still standing today, which means this home should be around for quite a while. This home, by the way, was built out of man-made limestone, which differs from natural limestone in that it is more durable, more cost-effective, and it's easier to work with. This is actually cast stone. And the work is the responsibility and the product of a Dallas-based company called Stone Legends. And although the company is based in Texas, their handiwork can be found in states all across the country. Their clients include Fortune 500 giants and a wide range of celebrities of people like Garth Brooks, Thomas Kincaid, Rusty Wallace, and Dale Jarrett, among many, many others. The company is an unbelievably impressive operation, as is the founder of the company, Richard Carey. Cast stone was a dead art. It's been around for about 2,500 years, but for some reason it didn't make the cut somewhere along the way. Illiteracy, other factors, but there's no books on the subject. And the last time I saw a resurgence of it, historically, was from the 1910s to the 1930s, and then it seemed to fall off the map again. Today, it's considered one of the primary design products. It's elements of the building, columns, balustrades, staircases, moldings, entablatures on the building, entries, fireplaces, it's on the floor, it's on the walls. What I saw was a consuming market that was hungry for something that would personalize and make their homes look special, their own added touch to it. And so the cast stone made it possible for, say, the average person to have a little piece of the castle all his own. Explain to me what cast stone really is. We forge the stone just like a blacksmith hammers steel and hammers it hard and pounds the molecules together. We're doing the same thing with silica sands and cementrous materials, we're putting them in a form and hammering them in there. The process is, involves a lot of talent and skills. Everything is handmade. There is little, if any, automation that can be accomplished because we don't make enough of one piece and it's our versatility to move from one shape to another shape that offers us the greatest advantage over other materials. Cast stone's more economical simply because we get to put a lot of time into one form and then use the form again and again and again. Therefore, we don't have to shape each piece individually, but we can actually use the form to help us do the shaping. We're using very small thumbnail size implements to tool the material when we bring it out of the forms. That way any molding lines or anything are taken out and we're able to get a product that looks as close to cut as you can possibly make it look. And the fact is, is that in many cases, cast stone will outlast limestone because limestone's a calcium-based glue and it erodes over time with acid rains and so forth. And the cast stone seems to hold up. There's examples of it that are over a thousand years old. Richard saw that there was an opportunity in this country for uh, architectural elements in, in stone. And he, um, uh, he built the company around the notion that as homes for affluent people became more elaborate, that they're going to want more stone pieces in their homes and established a business to address that market. He needed to sell his products outside of just his region of Texas and recognized that Architectural Digest was the most prominent voice in reaching interior designers, architects who are working on magnificent homes who had the need for high quality cast stone product both inside and outside the house. They manufacture pre-cast stone material and we do a lot of um, oceanfront homes. And because we design stone into these houses, you find that natural limestone does not uh, handle very well in that environment, especially on a salt air environment. So their stone actually handles very well. And what's great about the stone ledges material is that if we need replacement pieces, we can order replacement pieces because it's the man-made material versus having to find a, a natural stone in the same dialogue. We're about to choose a window surround, and once we choose the window surround, we're going to choose profiles that go with it, and then we're gonna automatically draw a 3D model of it so that we are certain that it fits. 
We're going to piece out each piece and put it on a cut ticket. And we're also going to search a database where we have some 25,000 molds and make a determination if we can leverage those molds or use those molds on the customer's behalf. We're going to choose the shape of the window first. In this case, we're picking the circle top window. And once he chooses a circle top, then we're going to go through and we're going to choose profiles for the sill. We've got a profile that goes to the surround and we've selected a keystone that we're going to put in there. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to determine the control dimensions. Often in a window, there are only two control dimensions, sometimes three. Once we have those from the field, then we're able to apply those and then come up with all the part dimensions and the assembly drawings through this program. Not only is it sizing each piece, but it's marking each piece in its respective position in the assembly. And now it's made a bill of materials, that's what's in red at the bottom. And at the same time it made that bill of materials, it also queried a database to see if those molds were available to us. And so there's the 3D model, there's the assembly drawing with each of the pieces marked and labeled. Two man hours yeah. in 100 seconds. And this is a program that you developed? Yes, we have a patent on it. This is where we make our molds. We have over 1,200 profiles hanging on the wall that we use in catalog and keep up with. And then we make extrusions or components that we assemble down here and make the different parts that we're going to make to carry off the project. This is an example of one of the 1,200 profiles that we extrude. In this particular case, he's making a straight section. We're going to cut it and fit it so that we can make parts out of it that fit into one of our units. So this would be making a positive and going to a negative. This is a positive model. We've cast around that and we've made removable parts in the mold. They'll actually take the mold apart while the material is still fresh. The best way I could describe it to you is, is that when you were a child playing on the beach and you packed that bucket full of sand and you flipped it over, I bet you can remember seeing the patent numbers in the bottom of the bucket. That's what kind of detail you can pull. We're going to use this form multiple times today. So we're going to do a casting and while it's in the sand castle phase, we're not going to leave it in this form. We're going to very carefully, with delicate hands, disassemble the form, and when we pull everything away, the sandcastle remains. Here's an example of a negative form. And what we've done here, we've made this mold in reverse. Instead of putting the model together first, we've gone straight for the mold itself. So we built the mold from scratch in reverse. So we made it hollow. We're in the art shop, and art by definition is very broad. But what I want to bring to your attention is, is that we work for architects that believe in classics. So there's certain disciplines here that reach far beyond art. This is a customer's design, not my own. And what happens is, is the artist interacts with the customer directly and he actually becomes part of the creative process. This is a classical design. But keep in mind, this column has four sides. So what we've done is, is we're going to make a mold to make a mold. So art is to my way of thinking, sits in two camps. One is we're replicating a discipline that's already been done, and the other is we're innovative like we were on the fish. We brought that together for the customer. We keep 25,000 forms ready to go. What that does is that converts to speed. It allows us to get to production much sooner than we would otherwise. It also allows us to do cost savings and pass them through to our customer. So the longer we're here, the more forms we catalog and keep up with, the stronger we are and the easier we can represent our customer's wallet while we're in production. It makes us more competitive and because we've done it before, it keeps our mistakes down. So we've got every advantage in keeping these forms. They start producing what it is that they need to go first. I mean, you know, what side of the house or what part of the building or which building, if it's a series of shopping centers or hotels or what have you. We want to make sure absolutely that we get on the truck what needs to be there first. And we want to make sure that we're not starting with the parts on the top instead of the parts they need to start with on the bottom. A lot of times I'll have guys out on the job site and they've got such a big project that they're like, I can't find this piece. Well, I can go into the computer and I can tell them which pallet that's on. I have made all my trucking companies liable. We go through all this effort to make these deadlines and to get the material there. If a carrier is not going to get it there on time, then we don't use them. When we do national deliveries, we have to make sure every product gets there in good order. After we've done the pre-wrap, that's to keep the stone pristine and tight, keep it from having any damage. Now we're going to take Excelsior, which is a wood fiber, and we're going to wrap the corners. As part of the stacking process, we have a technique where we tear away labels, and we stack the stone, and we staple the stone. 
What that allows us to do is keep a good quality of inventory control coming up on the pallet. It also gives us an order of the stack of the stone. This is the last step in the production process. We weigh each pallet. That way we can get the truck's maximum load and keep the cost efficiencies as low as possible. You want to pay attention to all the details and make sure that every step of the way you're very systematic in what you do and that when you deliver the product it goes all the way across the United States. He doesn't want to call in and say, can you send me one more stone because this one doesn't fit. And you can't make a profit doing that either. So what that means is, is that we as a company have to see problems before they happen and anticipate field conditions before we get there so that when we get there our stuff fits it's a one-time shot so we want to do it right the first time and that makes the labor on the job flow smoothly it makes our factory profitable and it gives the customer a very good taste in his mouth you know what you do is so interesting i can't help but wonder if do you consider that you have competition in this field i have an artist on staff mold makers, pattern makers. I have a complete architectural drafting department. We actually even innovate software in order to help us do what we do better, faster, and quicker. So competition, I'll tell you like I tell my customers. I can't put talent on a piece of paper and call it a bid. But once you settle on the price, the talent's there. A behind-the-scenes look at the magic of what can be created in cast stone is carried out by the artist at Stone Legends. I'm Doug Llewellyn reporting from Dallas.